And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Dina Merriam is with us. Began working in the interfaith movement back in the late 1990s. She founded the Global Peace Initiative of Women back in 2002, an organization chaired by a multi-faith group of women spiritual leaders. In 2008, she was one of the founding members of the Contemplative Alliance, which later became a program of GPIW. Dean is a longtime student of the great text of the Vedic tradition, currently the chairperson of the International Advisory Council of the Oroville Foundation, based in India. Dina, welcome back. Thank you. It's nice to be back. What have you been doing in these five years? Well, I've been writing books. I've been giving talks. Um, I've been organizing programs. Uh, you know, <laughs> this, this, of course, we've had the COVID epidemic, so a lot of the work has been on Zoom. We're just beginning to have in-person meetings uh, again, but there's no end to the need for people to come together and talk and share thoughts, share and, ideas. And you've written at least four books since you were on with me in 2018, haven't you? That's right. Yeah, I've just published my fifth book, and uh, I'm working on a new one. Well, good for you. Now, this one that I've got holding in my hand is called To Dance with the Dikinis. Is that how you pronounce them? Dikinis. Dikinis. Who are, what are Dikinis? Well, Dikinis is a, 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 I guess you would say a a Buddhist word, um, although it's maybe also in the Hindu tradition. It's really a celestial female figure. So you might call them angels in the West. We, We would call them angels. Okay. I like that. And this is based out of India? Yeah. The, the book is based partially in India and partially in Tibet. It goes back to the 12th century. You know, my interest has been, I think, the, the essential human question is what happens when you die? There's no human <laughs> that can escape that question. And it's an age-old issue. But I think that where death is like the last frontier, and I think that we're... Uh, the science community at some point will help us provide some answers to that question. And I think it's a question that everybody eventually will face or ask themselves at that moment, won't they? Exactly, because everybody, I mean, as you grow older, you know, you lose parents. Uh, So many people, I mean, I've lost my parents in the last year, and they were old, you know. It It was a very natural, timely way for them to go. Yeah. But my relationship didn't end with them. I still feel in contact with them. And I think that's a common experience, more common than we realize, uh, that people don't feel it's the end, that that they feel there's an ongoing relationship and ongoing life. What is that life? That's the question. Exactly. And you went searching for your past reincarnated lives, didn't you? Yeah. Well, just as we ask what happens after, the next question is, well, what happens before? <laughs> if we know ourselves to be an eternal soul and that death is not the end. I mean, there are two ways of looking at the universe. The materialistic view, which is it's just oh, everything is materialistic. It comes by accident and then finishes. If you don't hold to that view, if you know there's a soul and you believe in, in the, 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 the eternality of the soul, well, then the question is, the soul existed before we came into the body. If it exists after, it existed before. And it, the body is just a vehicle for that, ex, that soul to experience the physical world. And so, yes, so I, I, I wouldn't say I went looking. I said my path came looking for me. I began to have memories, and I think it's not uncommon. There are many people who have written to me that reading my books has helped them recover their own past. And I, I think that's the point. I mean, I share my own experiences. Because I think that if you realize that this is not your first time around, it changes your whole experience with death. You know, the fear, uh, you, you, can, you can really get over that fear. I mean, yes, there's always going to be a sense of loss because you're, you're moving into a different reality, which means, you know, you won't have the same body, you won't have the same house, your friends might look different. Um, but you know that you're ongoing and it's not the end. And it's not the end at all. How did you end up in Tibet, Dina? That's a good question. I mean, I, I, you know, have worked globally, and I've worked with people in conflict areas all over the world. 
So one of the sort of like uh, uh, conflict areas that's not in the he headlines now is this China-Tibet situation. Uh, Tibet was uh, occupied by China uh, after World War II and is still under occupation. And I didn't know much about Tibet, and though I've worked in my interfaith work, I've, I've, I've uh, met with different uh, Tibetan leaders as just part of the whole Buddhist community. But I had a grandson uh, born, and he began to, as, at a very young age, if you, if you watch children when they're young, often they reveal things about their past. And this grandson started talking about Tibet and how he was killed in the, in the uh, in invasion. Oh, my God. Invasion. How old was he when he started talking about that? About four years old. Jeez. And I couldn't discount it because he said, you know, he was so drawn to Tibet. When he was he was uh, going to bed, he wanted to listen to the chanting of Tibetan monks. He, he knew the chants. He knew some of the, uh, the deities. I mean, he just knew so much. Of course, you know, he began to outgrow that, and he still remembers that, but he sort of moved. Now he's much older. Um, but I've seen that if you watch kids, you can see something about the past. So anyhow, he began talking to me a lot about Tibet. And eventually I began to remember a birth a long time ago. It wasn't that a recent birth <laughs> in Tibet that had a great impact on me because um, it was also part of, of my search for the higher truth and to learn about, you know, my search for, for what is real. You know, what is this life about? I think through many lifetimes I've been asking that question: What is this life about? What comes after? And and how can we how can we come to know uh, things about the universe? And I always come back, you know, spiritual practice, prayer, and meditation, um, listening to the counsel of the wise ones. Um, there are many ways that you can grow in your understanding of what this life is about. Well, there's no question. The Tibetans are very spiritual people. Did you find that to be the case? The Tibetans are very spiritual people, and they have a, uh, a long history, and surprisingly, there was a time when they were a very powerful empire. Um, they had a great king in the 8th century, and they uh, have a very large empire, a very important empire. It was the center of trading between China and um, the, the eastern world, east of Tibet, you know, India, and then the, um, the the steppes that were north of it. So it was a very important and wealthy kingdom, uh, but gradually their attention turned from the material to the uh, spiritual. And so more and more of them entered monasteries when Buddhism came in, because they had a pre-Buddhist uh, religion, which was very much nature-based, like not so different from our Native American traditions, where people uh, commune with the spirits of the earth and the spirits of the water. They saw spirits everywhere. Uh, and so a lot of their um, earlier traditions, a lot of the earlier traditions everywhere around the world was nature-based. And that was very interesting to me because I think that's something that we need to sort of regain our, our sense of harmony with nature our sense of seeing nature as alive and sort of gaining a, a much deeper respect and appreciation for nature, what nature has to offer, that was ingrained in all the early cultures, you know, way back. And over time, we've lost that. So now we just abuse, you know, the rivers and the oceans and our soil and forests without realizing the, the repercussions. Dana, in the book, you talk about three successive lives. How did you come across them? So, yes, so during my exploration of this life in Tibet, I was faced with a great problem. Uh, uh, and I wanted, to, I, I, I couldn't get to the source of that problem. And there was a, a so called spiritual leader who was really a cult leader. You know, we have such people today. And he held a great sway over my mind. And I ended up giving him all my resources. My husband had recently died. So I gave him everything. And it's the question of this happens, you know, it happened then, it happens today, where, where uh, people gain control of others' minds, and you don't question. And so I, I, I had to get, I was driven to find out the cause, why. Why does this man have such a hold on me? So I had to go back to a previous birth where I saw this man also pursuing me, 
And I came to understand a lot, but it wasn't the source. I had to go back even earlier to a previous birth to see that this man was a son that I had abandoned and that had grown to hate me, really. Oh, jeez. He he pursued me until he took his revenge. (laughs) But in seeing all that in that life in Tibet, having gone back into the past and finding the cause of the his hostility, I was able to resolve the relationship and finish it. Because, you know, relationships follow us from one life to, to another. And I, I, it made me look at my current life and say, okay, who do I have problems with? Where are the things unresolved? Well, I want to finish them now. I don't want to have to face this challenge again. So if we don't resolve a challenge, we can know it's going to come back to us. In the end, we have to resolve all the difficulties that we face. And we do it now or we do it later. What procedures, Dina, did you use to uncover these three past lives? What was the question? What procedures did you use to uncover them? I I, I didn't use any procedures. My, My memories just come naturally, often in meditation and introspection. I know there are people who go to something called past life regression. Yes. I don't encourage that because I think whatever comes naturally, it's for a purpose. And whatever doesn't come naturally, you don't really need to know. So I, I just trust sort of like, you know, I think a lot of people have um, sort of vague glimpses. Oh, I must have known that person before. Or I must have been there before. In my case, for some reason, I have very clear memories. So I remember conversations, I remember scenes, and I watch it like a movie. So often when I'm sitting in meditation, I'm I'm in the middle of a movie, and I'm watching the scenes unfold, and there's nothing I do. It just happens. Must you be in meditation mode in order to pull out those past lives? No, No. I mean, it often happens that way because the mind is stilled, you know, if the mind's busy doing, doing, if you're working or whatever, the mind is occupied. But it can be, you know, when I'm taking a walk in the woods or whenever the mind is kind of stilled, um, when I'm sitting outside, just sitting outside reflecting, um, it's usually when the mind is quiet. Uh, sometimes it's when I'm in bed at night. Uh, and I found that I, I keep pads and pencil around my house by my meditation seat, by my bed, just so when things come to me, I can record them uh, because, um, you know, then the mind gets busy and you forget. And often an important scene that fills in a piece of a puzzle. I mean, to me, life is like a grand puzzle. And with each life is like a different part of the puzzle that you fit in. And you say, ah, this is what that looks like. Now that makes sense because that part of the puzzle is related to that part of the puzzle. And so it's, actually amazing when you can see, if you, if you can step by, back and see, as God would see, all of our lives, it all would make sense. It makes perfect sense. And it, it, it's very hard to judge without knowing who somebody's been in the past, you know? I mean, you, you see somebody who's had a lot of suffering, well, you don't know who they've been in the past. You know, what, what brought about that suffering? I mean, life doesn't make sense unless you can see the whole picture. Well, you had mentioned that these past lives had an effect on your current life. And has it changed you? It has changed me dramatically, I would say, because it's changed my whole relationship with death. And it's also made me realize that there's no saying goodbye. I mean, people that you love, you meet again and again. And even though your soul recognizes them, even though you look different, they look different, your soul recognizes them. So... In this book, um, there's, there's uh, this woman is married. She's a wonderful marriage, a man who she just adores. It's after, her, it's after his death that she kind of falls into this very dark place and comes under the sway of this man. But when she goes back into the past, she realizes that she had known this man, her husband, in, a, in her past birth, but they couldn't get together. He was a a monk and committed to his vows, and she she fell in love with him, but they couldn't fulfill their love. And that was one of the sort of uh, difficult things for her, is that they couldn't come together. But in her current life, 
they marry, and she has a perfect fulfillment of that relationship. And so I think that's really the way it works, you know, is if, if whatever desires can't be fulfilled in one life, it might not be the, act, the next life. It could be the life after that. But eventually, all the, our desires are fulfilled. Who makes that happen like that, Dina? You know, there's this thing called karma, which is the law of cause and effect. Right. And I don't consider that to be a system of reward and punishment. I, I see it as a, an energy system, just like there's the law of gravity. If you throw something up, it's going to come down. And it always happens that way. That's a law of the physical universe. So whatever you put out, your thoughts, thought is energy. Your thoughts, your desires, your actions, they they have a rebound. I mean, they have a, a, they eventually produce an effect. And so I see the law of cause and effect as a learning. You know, where this whole this whole universe is designed for our learning, our learning to become more loving, more compassionate more giving, more understanding, a better person. And it's a slow process, life to lifetime. If we hurt somebody, well, we have an opportunity in the future to make amends for that. And that's something that we want. I mean, there's nobody punishing us. We ourselves do it to ourselves because we, we want to learn and grow. We hurt somebody, you know, you know or we uh, leave a marriage in a, in a bad way, we abandon somebody, whatever it is. Well, deep inside, we, we want to make amends for that, even if we're not conscious of it. And we'll give ourselves an opportunity in the future to make amends. I was always told that we don't remember our past lives in our current life because it would play havoc with us. And listening to you, that doesn't seem to be the case. Well, I think it, I think it could play havoc with us. You know, um, uh for example, I heard a story of a, of a great teacher, and one of his students came to him with a newborn child, and he said he almost dropped the child because he saw that the child was a murderer in his last life. And I suppose the mother looked, knew that. That would be a terrible thing. Each time you're given a fresh opportunity, you know, what are you going to make of your life? You're not consciously burdened by your memories. And I think also when I first had my experience, um, I wrote my first book, My Journey Through Time, and I began to remember my birth just previous, which uh, took place in the early part of the 20th century. I died in Europe during World War II. I was a single mom at that time, raising two teenage sons. I held the job. It was destabilizing, and and I couldn't talk to anybody. I had one friend I could talk to about it, but, you know, there weren't many people I could talk to. And yet I was seeing scenes from World War II, and here I was, in a, you know, I'd be in a meeting at work and hearing sirens from World War II. It was very destabilizing, and thank God I had a, a meditation practice, which, you know, calms one and, and helps one uh, ground oneself. I would think you'd go wacky sometimes, knowing this. Well, you could. Well, you know, my I had been... Um, married before my divorce to a psychiatrist. And so I also have a part of me that questions myself. Sure. And so I said to myself, how do I know this is not my imagination? Uh, and I actually played something of an investigator. I went to the places in Europe where I had uh, seen myself living. Uh, I went to a place in Russia where I, I'd seen myself being born. I checked myself out. And then there were many signs all this happened because of a man that came into my life, and he began speaking to me in another language and referring to another place. Hold on, Dina. We're at a break. We'll come back and pick it up right there. Dina Miriam with us to dance with the De Quintas. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Dina Miriam. Dina, you had mentioned, how do you know these reincarnation glimpses aren't part of an imagination that just pops into your head? How can you rule that out? So when it, when it first began to happen and I began reliving my past birth, uh, which was in the uh, early years of the 20th century, I became something of an investigator. And I would check out things that I saw, even go to places that I envisioned. And um, I was after a while, I said, okay, this is real. And it, it, it made perfect sense to me. It, it wasn't 
wild or out of the blue. It made perfect sense, the life that I had lived. It was almost like a, um, leading up to what I was doing in my current life. It, 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 it was a natural flow and follow-up. And that happened when I saw the life before that. Well, that all came very naturally. And I, I eventually stopped checking myself out and going to places, and I accepted. But when I first put the, wrote my book, um, My Journey Through Time, which is the first book, which talks about my birth just previous to this, and then the one previous to that. It goes back several lives. Um, a friend of mine saw the draft. I only published it. I was really doing it for my own, uh, uh, just to, 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 to record what I was seeing myself, to see if it made sense, which I saw that it did. A friend of mine who had just gotten diagnosed with pancreatic cancer uh-huh. uh, read the draft. She was a writer. And she said, Dina, you've got to publish this. And she said, this, she was a, a Jewish woman, so she did grow up with the concept of reincarnation, but she just started to meditate. And it helped her so much as she approached her own death. She eventually died. Uh, but it gave her such comfort to know that it wasn't the end. And so she encouraged me to publish the book. Uh, so I showed it to a few of my spiritual friends, because I work in the interfaith world. And they said, Dina, you, you can't publish this under your name. And I said, but, but it's my life, because I talk a lot about my current life. I said, how can I not publish it under my name? So I did. I published <laughs> it under my name. And it, it's been out there now for several years. And a few years ago, I, as I said, I work in the interfaith world. A, a very respected Christian theologian emailed me and said, Dean, I've just read your book. I have to talk to you about it. And I thought, oh, you know, oh, no, he's... This is not accepted in the in the Abrahamic right. It's world. coming. It's coming back to backfire on me, right? Yeah, and so I didn't respond to his email. He emailed me again. He said, "Please call me. I must talk to you about this." So I I finally did call him, and he said, "After reading your book, I started to research this whole uh, uh, science of reincarnation because I see it as a science, not a belief system." And he said, there's so much evidence now. Now, I've never looked into it because, looked into the research, because I'm not looking to be convinced. To me, it's it's just a fact of life. But he did a lot of research, and he told me about book after book of psychologists who have done these studies. And he said, the evidence is is irrefutable. And that's why I think the scientific community at some point, and we may be approaching that, will say, yes, this, this is what happens. This is the way it works. And it, it, I read one of the books that he told me about, uh, and it's very compelling. So many stories of children who knew things they couldn't have known. There's no other way to explain uh, things that they know. You know, for example, a guy has a family. He gets killed in a motorcycle accident. He's reborn in a village some uh, uh, distance away. And when he's a small child, tells his parents, I've got to go find my family because I have to tell them where the important papers are. So this four-year-old kid, the parents finally take him to where he tells them to take a, to the family, and he tells his woman who had been his wife where the where his papers are that where his um, wealth was, things like that, stories like that. No and, way. And, they, and they found the papers, right? They found exactly where he said they were. He said it's hidden away. I hid them away. Nobody else knew where the papers were. He had kept them hidden because he didn't know he was going to be killed as a, as a young one, as a young man. But he had children, and, and he remembered all the children. Now, as he grew older, that family became less important, and he sort of grew into his current life. Uh-huh. You know, you have okay. to sort of, you, you can't live in the past. Uh, uh, and so, you know, imagine what a strange thing for a four-year-old to meet his wife from his previous birth. Who well, maybe well, why do you think, years old. Dina, why do you think we reincarnate? Are there just not enough souls or what? I think, as I said, it's a learning. I mean, we're not finished with our spiritual growth. You know, we have a lot more to learn and a, a lot more to grow into. You know, we're we're growing into becoming angels. <laughs> um, I would use a different word for that in the Eastern tradition, but in the Western tradition, we would call them angels. We're evolving, and eventually, we, we'll stop reincarnating because we'll we'll have a permanent place in one of the celestial realms. But until we've worked out our desires. If you don't fulfill all your desires in this life, you don't have a, the perfect love, you don't have the perfect job, you don't have the wealth that you would like, 
you don't have a very healthy body. Well, you, you can't get it all in one life. There's nobody who gets it all in one life. And so we die with unfulfilled aspirations and expectations. You know, you want to be a great writer, a great singer, whatever it is. So until all of those desires are fulfilled, we get new opportunities. And then we see, well, that didn't really, that's not really the answer. You know, you, you, you're poor, you want great wealth. Well, you're born again and you're a billionaire, but you're not happy. Okay, so you learn that lesson. It's not money that makes you happy. When I was a kid, I believed in reincarnation. And I always thought reincarnation was an act of per perfection, where the more you die and come back, the closer you get to being perfect in that heavenly state. What do you think of that? Exactly. That's exactly what I think is, is the, that's the way it is. That's the purpose of it is we are perfecting ourselves. We're learning and hopefully, I mean, if, if you don't learn in one life, you, you, you get the same lesson again. But hopefully we learn the things we have to learn. And it's a process of perfection. That's why I don't see it as a, as a form of reward and punishment. It's a, it's a process of learning, awakening, coming into a higher and higher state of being so that we can reside permanently in a higher dimension. Now, what we call the celestial world, I think scientists are coming to the point where they recognize this is a multidimensional universe. And so we might call it another dimension of reality. I mean, we know that our senses are very limited. We can only see within a certain band, our, our, within our sight. Our hearing is very limited. We can only hear within a certain band. And so there's much that we can't see and hear with our physical senses. Well, we can't see and hear those other dimensions. But it doesn't mean that we can't at some point uh, uh, determine their reality, that they exist. And I think modern physics is coming to the realization that we do live in a multidimensional universe. And the material universe is only one aspect of it. Do you think in our very first life, the first time we were on this planet, before we even reincarnated the first time, that we were wretched, horrible people? Or could we have been nice from the get-go? Well, I think we may have not had such an individual consciousness. You know, it may have been like, you know, in the early tribal communities, there wasn't a strong sense of ego identification, of I, mine. You know, it's like with the animals. They don't have a sense of ego identification. There's no sense of I want this. They live a rather, um, you know, in harmony with the natural law. They eat, they reproduce, they sleep, and they die. And I think that our early incarnations were not so different from that. And gradually, we develop a sense of I-ness, of me. This is what I want. This is what I want to become. And we're not part of this collective tribal group. We're individuals. And that indi individuation, you know, gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, and then again, we have to move beyond that into a sense of, well, we're responsible for the whole. We're not just responsible for ourselves because what we do impacts the whole. And so, you know, our behavior doesn't just affect our own little circle. It affects the whole world, you know, when we, you know, um, are careless, you know, environmentally, well, that has an impact, you know, uh, on, on a lot of things. Uh, if, if we have real anger and hatred, well, you, you affect a lot of people with that anger. You know, I, I find that if I meet an angry person, you know, I'm unsettled for the whole day. If you meet somebody who really has, is nasty, well, it's very unsettling. So you think of all the people that one angry person has unsettled. So we have a responsibility. And I think we have to grow into the sense of collective responsibility that we're responsible for more than just ourselves. So I think it's an evolution, an evolution from not having much of a sense of I-ness and then growing into a sense of strong ego identification and then moving into a higher awareness of a, being responsible for a much larger uh, group of people than just ourselves. Share another story for us about reincarnation and an individual, if you can. Another story about reincarnation? Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, I mean, I've had, I've had experiences of, um, I'm trying to think, there's so many to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one thing that I, I've seen again and again, and, and I've looked into many of my past lives, you know, many, um, and what I've seen again and again is that the message that comes to me 
is always about love. And I think when we talk about evolution, we're evolving into a higher state of love where it's not just, you know, love for self and family, but it's just love, you know, which means love for all that is, love for the forest, love for the rivers, uh, love for love for people that we don't know, just a state of love. There's a lot of hate out there too, Dina. What's that? There's a lot of hate out there. Well, the love has to counter the hate. There's a lot of hate out there. That's why the world is roiling right now, you know, with, with conflict. There's so much anger and hate in the world. And it's unsettling so many people. I mean, uh, 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 it's it, you know, but I think that we're moving into a, I think we have to, and again, if you look at the conflicts in the world now, it's the result of karma that has not been resolved. The Palestinian and Israeli conflict, it's karmic knots, you know. I've done a lot of dialogues. 20 years ago, I was doing dialogues between Palestinians and Israelis. And I saw there were karmic knots, old, old wounds that have not been healed. You look at Ukraine and Russia, old, old wounds. Russia still thinks it's an, it's an empire. They still want to recreate the empire and reclaim their territories. Well, you can't reclaim the past. It's a new reality. And the new reality is that each country gets to determine for itself what it wants to be. But what makes the individuals so hateful? What's that? What makes the individuals so hateful? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I think a lot of it, I mean, if, if you look at <clears throat> someone like Putin, he obviously has a lot of insecurities. Why does he need to uh, assert himself so forcefully? I mean, he obviously, he feels he's a victim. And I, when I've dealt with uh, in conflict areas, because I, you know, did dialogues in Iraq during the war, and I've done dialogues in Afghanistan, there's a great sense of victimhood in almost all conflict areas. Uh, and, you know, it's the same thing when I did dialogues with the Israelis and Palestinians. Well, they both had, you know, rightful grievances. Um, but the difference is they couldn't hear the other side. The only time we came to a breakthrough, and, you know, I, I, I saw my own karma, why I found myself doing dialogues with Palestinians and Israelis. And if I look back into my past life, I saw that I was, I died, uh, um, I wasn't Jewish in my past birth, but I'm Jewish in, in this life, but I died during World War II, and I witnessed what was happening to the Jews. I was an emigre myself from Russia, you know, left, left uh, Russia during the revolution there, and found myself without a home in Europe, but I saw what was happening around me and felt compassion, and, and yet helpless. So then here I find myself, as a young woman in this life, doing dialogues to try to create peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. And in, 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 in the first dialogue I did with the Palestinians and Israelis, it was, it was painful because there was such an airing of grievances. And it was only after about four days that they began to hear each other. And they began to say, oh, I hear your suffering. I hear what you've gone through. Did they understand each other? They came to understand each other. And there's still friendships that emerged from that dialogue 20 years ago. And I continue to work with um, a few Palestinian Israelis who want nothing more than peace. They just want to finish this. But it's this hardcore group that wants to destroy Israel. And it's like, they're there. Y you know, <laughs> what are you going to do? Except they're there. Find a way to live together. You know, so both sides have to give in a little bit. Um, but to get rid of the hatred, which is carried over from, um, you know, there, there are these... Since the beginning of time, do you know? What is that? Since the beginning of time. Do you, can you hear me all right? Oh, yes, yes. It's since the beginning of time, you know, look, Cain and Abel, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's a story of today. David and, Go David and Goliath. David and Goliath. I mean, I think, you know, it's good versus evil. They're always going to be, and of course, things are more complicated. It's never that one side is all good and one side is all bad. It's people carry their hurts, intergenerational traumas. And until we can understand and sympathize with them and, and find a way not to fostering anger and hatred. I mean, there are religious leaders who foster this victim sense of victimhood. You know, and, and they, they, because that gives them power over people. 
Where do we get you? We, where do we get your books? Well, you can get my books on Amazon if you just search for books by Dina Miriam. And I think the first book is sort of the beginner for people to see how I uh, came to, to to see my memories or came to have faith in what I was seeing, how I questioned myself and then sort of investigated and came to an understanding yet that this is real. This is real, and it helped me understand so much about the work I do today, about my life today. Um, it, it, it provided a lot of clarity for me. And your website, you'll have to give us the letters. Go ahead. Okay. I have two websites. One is Dina Miriam Writes, which actually is my Facebook page. Uh, but the website is the Global Peace Initiative of Women, the initials G P I W dot org. And there I talk a lot of the peace work that we continue to do. G P I W dot org. Simple enough. Simple enough. We're going to come back and take calls with you in a moment, Dina about reincarnation. How long does it take you to meditate, to pick up a past life? I spend about an hour in the morning, and it could be months and months and months before I recapture a whole narrative. I see glimpses, and then I wait for the next glimpse. And it it could take many, many months before I have a whole narrative of a life. But then when it comes to you, there it is, right? Then I start writing. Yeah. All right, we're going to come back in just a moment with Dina Merriam and take some phone calls next hour on Coast to Coast. Jump aboard.